Hello, everybody. Welcome on behalf of Cambridge University Press. My name is Paul Edmondson, and I'm head of research for the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust in Stratford-upon-Avon. And I'm joined by Stanley Wells, and I'm honorary president of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust in Stratford-upon-Avon. I'm here to talk with Stanley about his new book, What Was Shakespeare Really Like?, forward by Stephen Fry, who thinks very highly of it. Stanley, how did this book come about for you? Well, it came about uh, because I was invited to give four lectures for my 90th birthday in 2020. Uh, I'd begun thinking about the subject even before the invitation came. But when it did, I, I realised this was an opportunity uh, to cast my thoughts about the subject into intellectual form. And I wrote the lectures. And then the pandemic came and it was not possible to give the lectures in public. So, uh, as you know, uh, we recorded them, uh, shortened versions of them, and you helped me to do that in my home instead of their being delivered in public. Now, you have a long track record of working with both of our major university presses, yes, but I let's do, just think yeah. about Cambridge. Yeah. Uh, although Oxford say that you've written more books of them than any other person. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cambridge University Press, editor of Shakespeare, their Shakespeare survey for 19 years. Yes, yeah. Your books for them include Looking for Sex in Shakespeare, Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, Evidence authorship controversy the shakespeare circle yeah. and alternative Along biography with you, yes. all the sonnets yes. of shakespeare and yeah. then what was shakespeare really what like it, yes. <laughs> it's got four chapters yes what manner of man was he how did he write a play what do the sonnets tell us about his life and what made him laugh yeah so uh, let's just work through each of those four chapters stanley and there is a fifth chapter i hope we get on to as well yeah. um how did you set about uh, uh, deciding your approach to describing what manner of man was he what where does that phrase come from what manner of man was he uh, well it's it, it's used in in the in the plays it's used in henry the fourth uh what what sort of a chap was he is, is the way we we might put it and uh i i set about trying to do that by various means thinking uh for example what he said about himself what other people said about him. The quite interesting remarks about him uh, made by people throughout his, uh, his, his mature life, uh, people liked him. It's interesting that uh, there's only one derogatory remark about him, and that's the first time we hear of it in print, when his rival Robert Greene uh, refers to him as an upstart crow. It's become a famous phrase, of course. The people uh, who liked him, what did they say about him? Well, the, the, the sweet Master Shakespeare, the word sweet recurs. There's, it must have been a sweetness of nature which impressed people. And it, 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 Ben Jonson, for example, uh, refers to him in these terms. Ben Jonson was a great fan, although he was also, of course, a great rival of Shakespeare, which shows a lot for the friendship between them, that Jonson was able to speak very highly of Shakespeare personally, uh, well, may expressing, of course, in a slightly grumpy way, a few reservations. But, but, but there was also some some plays, for example, uh, written for the university, university plays, in which he's called a sweet master Shakespeare. So an undergraduate says, I'll get, I have his picture in my study at the court. It was that Shakespeare as pinup boy. See, he was a popular chap in, in, in London circles. And then that, that those kind remarks yeah. extended beyond his death, well, yes. especially with Ben Johnson. Well, they did, and of course, they, they resulted in action too. They resulted in the publication of the collected edition of his plays, the first folio, which uh, gathered together uh, the, both the plays that had already appeared in print and also quite a few more that had not previously appeared in print. That is the great tribute to him. Uh, it's, it's, it's put together by two of his colleagues, Hemmings and Condell, members of the Gacting Company, the King's Men, to which Shakespeare belonged, originally the Lord Chamberlain's Men, uh, which he was stayed with throughout his life. That, that in itself tells us something, I think, that he was a loyal man, that he stayed with the same company throughout his working life. And Ben Johnson has a great panegyric to Shakespeare at the beginning, doesn't he? He does indeed. Uh, the, the memory the, of my beloved, the author, yeah, a long Master poem. William Shakespeare, and what he had left. And what he had left, a long poem about, about Shakespeare, yes. 
So I think he's both visible and I think an, also an invisible presence behind the furniture. And the conversations with William Drummond. The conversation, and the... yes. In private, uh, which again is evidence that he really meant what he said. He's not without his grumpy side about Shakespeare, but he's very generous in, in his tributes. I loved him this side idolatry. Yeah, and, and then he attacks him for some of the shortcomings in his plays, like <laughs> yeah. giving Bohemia a sea coat, yeah. for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, very pedantic character, Ben Johnson. Uh, could we hear an extract from that chapter? Yes, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, what what I wrote is we, we can deduce something about Shakespeare's personal opinions from the plays. He seems to have distrusted people like Iago and Goneril and Regan and above all Edmund in King Lear, people who express a very rationalistic view of life and of morality. And on the other hand, he seems to have sympathised more easily with the sceptical irrationality of Edmund's father, Gloucester, or indeed of Hamlet. And there's a speech in one of the lesser known plays, All Swell That Ends Well, a speech by La Few, which a speech which is unnecessary to the action, in which I think for once we can hear Shakespeare himself speaking. He says, they say miracles are past, and we have our philosophical persons to make modern, which means commonplace, and familiar, things that are supernatural and causeless. Hence it is that we make trifles of terrors, ensconcing ourselves into seeming knowledge, when we should submit ourselves to an unknown fear. He's suggesting, you see, that clever, excessively rational people try to reduce to a commonplace level matters that are beyond human understanding, reducing the mysteries of the universe to a series of scientific formulae, making trifles out of terrors instead of opening their imaginations to the fullness of experience or submitting themselves to an unknown fear. That is to say, to the uncertainties of the unknown and the unknowable. And you know, it's an exact description of the error that Lady Macbeth makes when she says that she can ignore the promptings of the imagination, make thick my blood, she says, as she prepares to urge her husband to murder Duncan, stop up the access and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose. Essentially, I think this identifies Shakespeare as somebody who acknowledges the mystery of human life, but is not bound by any dogma. Thank you, Stanley. Chapter two, how yeah. did he write a play? Well, yeah. there is so little manuscript evidence to go on, six yeah. signatures and some of Sir Thomas More. Yeah. How do you start to describe how Shakespeare wrote a play? Well, you, question you, you look at the plays and you think about the, the, the theatrical conditions of his time. Uh, you, 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 we know that he was writing for a particular company, initially the Lord Chamberlain's men, later the King's men. We know that that had probably about 17, 14 to 17 actors. We know that some of the actors were, that all the actors were male, uh, and that some of them were boys, whatever exactly boy means, probably somebody up to between perhaps about 12 and 17, I, I guess. And if you look at the plays, you then start realising that the, 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 the cast lists of the plays reflect the, uh, the, the composition of, of the company, that there are very rarely more, any more than three female parts in the plays. Look at Antony Cleopatra, for example, where we've got Cleopatra, Charmian and Iris. And Octavia. Uh, and, and Octavia, Caesar's sister, yes. But an enormous list of characters. But an enormous list of, uh, uh, of other characters altogether. Uh, uh, and uh, Julius Caesar has what is the only two, I think. Uh, so th th he, he is constrained, but of course he makes a virtue out of the constraint uh, by, by, by making some some very great uh, female characters. I, I think you can you can tell sometimes uh, it, that, that that he would, had particular boys in mind. Uh, if you look at and at, at as you like it, for example, Rosalind and. Uh, um, Celia, C Celia uh, are, are complementary characters. So uh, he, he's a man who who cut his coat according to his 
cloth. He, 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 he was constrained, but he made a virtue out of the limitations of the company, I think. Now let's hear a little bit about how he plotted a play starting, okay. yeah, from this chapter. The ground plans for some of his plays are more schematically worked out than others. Much Ado About Nothing, for example, has an improvisatory air about it, as if at times we can catch him in the act of working out his plot as he goes along. The most obvious example is the fact that in the stage, in two stage directions, Hero's mother, no, known as Inogen, a form of Inogen, occurs, but she doesn't say anything. It's as if he'd thought he might need her for the plot, but eventually couldn't think of anything for her to, to say, or perhaps he realised that he simply didn't have enough boy actors to include her. Some plays include substantial episodes that are not essential to the plot, but which offer entertaining interludes. I think of Lance's scenes with his dog, La uh, Crab, in The Two Gentlemen of Verona, or sometimes you can see him writing reflection upon what's been happening, like the scene of the gardeners discussing the state of the Commonwealth in Richard II, or the dialogue between the Mad Lear and the blind Gloucester, profoundly moving dialogue in King Lear. Such scenes have been termed mirror scenes, and they can illuminate the significance that Shakespeare derived from his stories. But other plays, like the Comedy of Errors, Romeo and Juliet, The Tempest, are elaborately and neatly plotted, as if, like an architect designing a great cathedral, Shakespeare had created his overall design before going back to fill in the details. And there's no way in which the intricacies of the virtuosically designed last scene of Cymbelin, with its multiple denouement, there's no way in which that could have been improvised on the spur of the moment. Its composition required the same kind of intellectual effort as a contrapuntal masterpiece by Bach. Thank you, Stanley. So we, we've heard quite a bit about the plays. Chapter three is why, what do the sonnets tell us yeah. about Shakespeare's life? Why devote a whole chapter, whole es uh, essay, lecture to the sonnets? Because this these are the, th this is virtually the only area of Shakespeare's output where he's speaking in his own person. He, uh, as a dramatist, he's constantly projecting himself into the characters whom he's portraying. The sonnets are personal poems. Uh, they are a, a very varied collection of poems. Uh, th th they haven't been fully appreciated, I think, uh, because unfortunately in the 18th, late 18th century, great scholar Edmund Malone uh, said that the first uh, 126, 126 are, are all, he said, addressed to a boy and the remainder to a dark lady. Well, this isn't true. Uh, once we start... Uh, pulling them apart, looking at them individually, one realises that the sonnets are, are a far more varied collection of poems than that. And also, once one realises that they've been written over a long period of yeah, time, yeah. the form does become very personal in terms of Shakespeare's own poetic and intellectual and emotional interests. Yes, it? It, it does, yeah. Some of them are formal, some of them are poems that could have been made public, and some of them were made public even before they were appeared in 1609. Some of them are very intimate poems which you feel he would not have wanted to appear in his own lifetime. And it is interesting that, that he didn't publish the sonnets himself. Uh, they were published anonymously. Uh, well, they were published as being by Shakespeare, but not by Shakespeare himself. So a little extract from that chapter. OK, yeah. Really great. Well, let's, there are two basic questions. One is who arranged the sonnets, written at a variety of dates, some individually, others in pairs or clusters, who arranged them into the order in which they appeared in print in 1609? It must have been somebody who knew all the poems intimately and had thought hard about the way they relate to each other. Shakespeare himself seems the obvious candidate. The other question is, if some or all of the sonnets are concerned with real people, who are those people? Well, we'd love to have answers to the questions that the sonnets raise, if only because the answers would help us to know what their author was really like. If, for example, he cold-bloodedly handed over for publication love poems addressed to and concerned with persons still living, 
who would have known that he was putting their intimate relationships into the public domain, that would suggest a serious lack of concerns, of concern for the, their feelings. If the printed text of the sonnets derives directly or by way of a scribal transcript from Shakespeare's own manuscript, then it would appear that he had preserved manuscripts of all 154 sonnets, that he transcribed them into a single notebook as if for his personal use, a bit like a schoolboy collecting stamps, or more seriously, like somebody who writes poems with no expectation of publication, but who enjoys writing them out in his best handwriting. He, as if he'd done this for private perusal, or perhaps to be shown only to be selected private friends. But we don't know, we simply don't know how the poems got into print. The best that we can do is to examine the evidence and to form our own conclusions from what that evidence tells us. My conclusion is that Thorpe got hold by underhand means of a manuscript into which all the sonnets had been transcribed, probably by Shakespeare himself, certainly in an order that Shakespeare approved and which Thomas Thorpe followed. That the publisher's dedication to the sonnets is deliberately cryptic and may be addressed to some individual not in the public eye, and that Shakespeare disapproved of the publication, but kept quiet about it, possibly so as not to draw attention to it. Thank you, Stanley. Well, to change the mood, yeah. chapter four is what made him laugh. Ah, yes. Well, maybe we'll turn it around. What makes you laugh <laughs> in Shakespeare, Stanley? Yeah, well, there's a variety of comic techniques that, that, he, that he employs. Uh, word plays, a very famous one, and indeed almost infamous people. So it's one of the things that, that people occasionally complain about, the excessive uh, punning in, in Shakespeare's plays. There's a comedy of situation. He's, he's clever at devising situations, often where, where people uh, are uh, embarrassed. Uh, for example, the, the, the scenes in Love's Labour's Lost, where the, the lords uh, gradually come out of hiding and realize that the, 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 the secret that they've been trying to keep uh, is no longer a secret. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, overhearing scenes uh, sometimes uh, create laughter too. You just mentioned the lords in Love's Labour's Love. Yeah, Here's a little yeah. extract about that and other elements of Shakespeare's comedy from chapter four. Okay, I say Shakespeare was skillful in arousing laughter by devising situations of contrived discomfiture, embarrassment. Think, for example, the brilliant episode in Love's Labour's Lost, it's Act 4, Scene 1, in which Lord Biroon tra tricks his three friends, the King, Lord Dumaine, and Lord Longerville, tricks them into, re into revealing that they, like him, have fallen in love and into successively reading aloud the poems they've addressed to their lady friends, thus revealing their apostasy. I vividly recall the mounting and delighted glee of a young girl in the audience of a production long ago, as she wriggled in her seat, stuffing a handkerchief into her mouth to stifle her laughter as she anticipated the successful outcome of Biroon's trick. And there are similar episodes in later plays, like the more emotionally loaded overhearing scenes in Much Ado About Nothing, Troilus and Cressida, and also in a tragic vein, Othello and King Lear. Thank you, Stanley. So the fifth chapter yeah. draws on, well, more than eight decades of you working <laughs> with Shakespeare. Yes. Or just about eight decades, doesn't it? Yes, it What's does. What's your earliest memory of working or encountering Shakespeare? <laughs> My earliest memory is when I was at school, when I was a, a schoolboy uh, in, in the first form, uh, having to stand up in front of the class. We must have been reading the quarrel scene from Julius Caesar, and I and another boy stood up and did a duel with our rulers. <laughs> um, but then more later up the school, I got more seriously interested in Shakespeare, partly because I was able to see him performed. And, of course, I have throughout my life been able to see great performances of Shakespeare. Uh, I was able to see, a, 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 as a schoolboy, a, a great actor called Donald Wolfitt, 
uh, who, who would tour the provinces doing uh, the great roads. He was a rather selfish actor. He was uh, the, the barnstorming type of actor. He would play King Lear and Malvolio and uh, uh, Hamlet in his, in his, in his earlier days. Uh, he, he was a great character. And then when I went to London as an undergraduate, I was able to see, uh, well, particularly, for example, Laurence Olivier as Richard III and uh, as Antony, along with Vivian Lee, his wife, uh, uh, as Cleopatra. So I have been all my life interested in Shakespeare performed as well as Shakespeare on the page. Well, Stanley, the world salutes you as the leading Shakespeare scholar. I feel like I've been interviewing <laughs> Shakespearean royalty, oh, well, listening to Stanley. Well, well, well. Um, the areas of study that you've mentioned were uniquely reflected in the three great organisations that you were very much involved with in Stratford-upon-Avon yeah. for, for decades and still are. The Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, the Shakespeare mm -hmm. Institute, which you were director of and a student at yourself, the University of Birmingham, and of course, the Royal Shakespeare Company and all of the values and interests of those three great Shakespeare organisations come together in all of your publications. I didn't mention earlier the several Cambridge companions to Shakespeare that you've, yeah, you've, uh, you've edited, yes. co-edited. Yeah. Um, so thank you for telling us about your latest book, What Was Shakespeare Really Like? Well, I hope it's fun. <laughs>